so glad that you're here to celebrate Earth Day. One of my first memories of being in awe of nature was holding a dead mallard duck. My dad shot it. I cradled it. I was in awe of its heft and iridescent feathers, its smooth bill. Nature is amazing, breathtaking. And the awe of nature led me to the West, to the big trees and the mountains and the megafauna and the rivers. And I am not the only soul who made their way here or decided to stay here to make it or break it here. We all share many reasons why we're digging in and putting roots down. I have yet to meet a native, a newcomer, or a visitor who says, this place is perfect to watch Netflix. And I have yet to meet someone who does not list an environmental reason for calling this place home, be it the rivers, the wildlife, the mountains, or the vistas of our open valley. We can all close our eyes and we can see the awe of nature and we feel it in our hearts. And when we open our eyes, we may feel, feel awe or worry or fear or delight or heartbreak. I hear a lot of blame and complaining in the job I have. And I get it. We are experiencing an incredible amount of rapid change. Change is so hard. And there are very real losses this place is experiencing that we are experiencing. We can choose to point fingers at who or what is ruining the Gallatin Valley, or we can go find awe and inspiration and decide what we are willing to forgo to live in this beautiful place with a functioning ecosystem and leave it beautiful and functioning long after we're gone. So what could we give up? Green lawns, our cars, our own private 5, 10, 20 acre piece of paradise, access to everywhere all the time. Our very existence impacts the world locally and globally. There's no free lunch. The irony that I found awe and beauty in a dead dock is not lost on me. Or for anyone who skis down the slope that was once a forest, or finds oneself in a parade of recreation down the Madison River. If we want a future with awe and wonder, if we crave to be connected to nature, we will have to be discriminating and deliberate in our actions personally and collectively. Have a brown, brown lawn in August so fish can stay wet. Take the bus to reduce emissions. Show our support for management plans on public lands that may close trails in order to protect wildlife. Accept change in our neighborhoods in exchange for connectivity, open space, and habitat outside of town. These choices don't have to feel like sacrifices. These are choices of hope. Our actions diminish one future while building another. Happy Earth Day, human beings. Enjoy the show. You guys ready? All right, it's gonna go on right now. I got a, I got a mic, but I also talk really loud, so that's that guy's problem back there, okay? So I wanna ask you a question. I'm Bill Kleindl, right? I'm the host. So I wanna ask you a question. Uh, which one of you guys, how many of you guys in the audience have made uh, cups and some string? Let's see some hands. Okay, as, as I expected, People out there that haven't done it. What's up? You seem like a whole fully grown human being. It seems like something that you need to be doing. And for those of you that didn't, you saw other people didn't raise their hands, that's kind of your job to, after you leave the show is to find some Dixie cups and some string, please, right? So I, I was thinking about this telephoning thing and I was thinking about Alexander Graham Bell, 
right? And you know his famous words, Watson, please come here, I need you, right? Because of your Alexander Graham Bell nerds, right? So um, what did Watson say? Anybody know? He said, new phone, who dis, right? Um, so he came in, he's like, dude, I can totally hear you in the other room. It was amazing, it totally worked. What are we gonna call this thing? He's like, I don't know. Let's call it Far Voice. It's like, that's ah, a bad name. No one's gonna like that, it's kind of weird, right? So let's, let's, uh, um, let's, uh, let's convert it to Greek. Tela, which means far, and phone, which means voice, right? So a telephone, that sounds a little more true to its name, right? But then we shorten it up to phone, like, where's my phone? Or I'm, I can't, my batteries are gone and I can't, I, I've lost it. But if you replace voice back again, it's kind of weird, right? Like I can't, I don't know how to exist without my voice, which is funny. But anyway, um, I was thinking about how this idea of telecommunication right, to be able to communicate over long distances. And it turns out the earth does that in really cool ways. So there's some trees that they found in the Pacific Northwest that have this isotope of nitrogen in the tree, nitrogen 15. And they're like, how does this, and this isotope comes from ocean, ocean nitrogen. That's the only place it shows up, which is different than the nitrogen 14, which is more terrestrial. So how does this ocean nitrogen get into these trees? So they said they tried to back the they, the scientists kind of backpedal that. And when they said, okay, we have these salmon that are all the way up here in the Alaska Peninsula, eating small things, just chuck full of nitrogen 15, because that's what most of our DNA and our proteins, all that stuff is made out of nitrogen. So the salmon ingest that, they get full of it, and then they go all the way to their natal stream. Then they go all the way back up to the top of their natal stream where they do it, right? So I don't want to tell you something. I'm a professor at MSU, so most of my my lectures involve some stories around doing it. That's the only way you can keep people's attention usually. So um, what ends up happening is uh, they do it and then they die, okay? And so that's a known thing. The nitrogen comes all the way from the ocean, all the way up to the top of their natal stream. They, they have sex and they die. And then, then how do they get into the trees? So the fish biologists were like, grizzly bears eat them. They take them up and they poop in the woods, right? Eh, I don't know. So, so we know that, I, I'm, you guys have all taken uh, uh, college level ecology classes. I know you have there in the sparkly dress. So, so you have to remember that nutrients cycle, okay? They go up into the tree, they fall down in the leaves, they dissolve in the ground, they get pulled up in the tree again, that's nutrient cycling. But if we go back in the stream, we go all to the top again, they cycle in streams too, but because streams flow, the, the cycling spirals, it's called nutrient spiraling. So it's spiral, spiral, spiral. Flood happens. It's called flood pulse. Then the flood happens and drops all the, all the goop and the rotten fish and, the, and the, the algae and the bugs and the sediment. It drops it onto the floodplain. Then the trees pull it up into, the, into it. So here we have this thing all the way out here in the, in the Gulf of Alaska, all the way up the channel, then with some spiraling and some cycling through it and the flooding and it goes up into the tree. That's telecommunication over really long distances. It's pretty awesome. <laughs> I know, right? Thank you, whoever that is. <laughs> so um, so let's, uh, let's have another example. So there's grizzly bears up in the mountains in uh, Glacier Park, around 10,000 feet. And they're tearing apart the talus and they're eating moths. They're just munching on them. What are the moths doing there, says some inquisitive MSU grad students. Turns out they're what? Doing it. <laughs> A laugh track, that's what I needed to hear. Thank you very much. Um, so, so they're doing it up in the 10,000 feet. And, but where are these moths coming from, right? So the grad students climb up there and they have two things they need to worry about, three things they need to worry about. They're working at 10,000 feet, that's tough. 
But it's also full of grizzly bears, so that's also tough. And lightning bolts, which is kind of, because there's lots of exposure up there. So they get up, they grab a bunch of these moths, and then they take them back to the lab. Meanwhile, they bring out this great big um, satellite dish they point it straight up below the mountains, and they see these huge clouds of moths flying from the east to the west and landing up there in the, in the mountains and landing the talus and doing it. And then they fly back to where? Right? So they check, the grad students look at these moths, look at some more isotopes from carbon this time, and those isotopes are coming from corn and grasslands as far away as Nebraska and South and, uh, South and North Dakota. Right? So these moths are way over there. They're army cutworms. They're, they, the moths do it. Then they fly back to Nebraska and lay the eggs. Then they go through another cycle. Then they loft themselves up to 10,000 feet and they fly all the way over and land in the mountains and they get eaten by grizzly bears. So another sense of, <laughs> another, another sense of this telecommunication, right? So it turns out the earth is super complicated. So let's get back to the Gallatin Valley. We've got the same thing with grizzly bears. No, sorry, black bears. They live up in the Gallatin Range. But in the spring, they come down and they go down to the Galton River, right? And where do they go? Right down your alley or through your backyard, which is amazing. So when you go to school and at, the, at Irving School and there's a bear and a cub sitting up in the trees across from the, from, the, from the school, which is totally wild. We have grizzly or black bears. They have grizzly bears in Missoula walking down their alleys. In Bozeman, we have, walk, we have black bears going down their alleys, which is incredible, but until we think about well, we have black bears in our alleys, but actually we have alleys and whatnot in their corridors, which is kind of a bummer because it affects them. We're gonna be talking about that through the show. But, but let's get back to this idea of, <coughs> of communication, right? So ecosystems communicate over really large distances, which is amazing. And, and people like National Science Foundation, macrosystems, biology, they study these things. So we about how amazing and complicated the planet is, which is so, so But how do you guys get into that? And I'm gonna tell you how you get into it. You get two Dixie cups and some string, and I'm pointing right at you, and you tie them together and you talk through it and you can hear it on the other side, right? So this is <laughs> Thank you very much. It's, it's actually amazing. So. Anyway, whole evening of that junk. So we're gonna talk about, about corridors and animals crossing, in, but we're also gonna have song and dance and juggling and, and acrobatics and the whole kit and caboodle. It's gonna be amazing. But let's start it out with some music by the greatest band on earth, End of Alder. Here they come. All right, more later. second while Tom does some tuning. Thanks for being here, y'all. Great job, Bill. What a hilarious guy, right? We were all fortunate enough to have him as a professor, and it was a great time, let me tell you.
bands in the valley absolutely and I'm another bad dude but in another way uh, my name's Noah Johnson I'm uh, so honored to be here in front of all y'all rattling some jaw here this evening in Bozeman's historic Crawford Theater in Bozeman's iconic Emerson Center for the Arts uh, before I get into it let's just give a hand for everybody putting on the show I, I'm talking about our producer Michelle Risso Jennifer uh, Dakota, everybody. I mean, they got a spread for us backstage. It's looking like Versace back there. They're giving us Hollywood treatment. I mean, this Mediterranean making the four season look like McDonald's. Hallelujah. Anyways, but um, <sighs> but we're here for a reason tonight. You know, the theme of tonight is the pathway for a pathway to success. And um, I'll just start by saying that uh, the distinguished modern historian Walter Isaacson recently wrote, the scientist does not study nature because it is useful. They study it because they enjoy it, and they enjoy it because it's beautiful. When Michelle pitched the idea of this gig to me, um, you know, making wildlife biologists and the public laugh about roadkill on Earth Day, my body lit up with the excitement and the prospect of scandal. Um, <laughs> Michelle, she was talking about how, you know, wildlife biologists are peculiar individuals who have a proclivity to adopt some of the characteristics of the species that they study. And it kind of made me think, I'm like, hmm, you know, if I was a wildlife biologist, Noah, what would you study? I mean, given that framework off the top of my head, I could think of, you know, a pronghorn, bighorn sheep, maybe water buffalo, maybe something scarier, more territorial, like a honey badger. Um... But I feel like, you know, as living sentient human beings, there's this larger creative act that we're all a part of that none of us directly control. I mean, we all share a lot more than a common ancestor in planet Earth. I mean, from an evolutionary perspective, both the simplest coronavirus and the most complex human are essentially protein-wrapped packages that contain and seek to replicate the genetic material encoded by their nucleic acids. The only difference between me and a water buffalo is that this animal, rattling some jaw in front of y'all on the stage right here, found a way to evolve with just one horn. Um, kind of like a narwhal. Uh, but, I mean, excuse my ridiculousness, but I, I'm a Southerner. I'm a, you probably hear my voice. I'm from Dallas, Texas. So my perspective, my worldview, my paradigm is a little different than any old educa educated Dr. Montana here in the audience with us tonight. I'm looking at you, Bill Kleindell. For example, whenever I'm exposed to a discussion about the groundbreaking gene editing technology CRISPR that gave us mRNA vaccines, 
I'm thinking about fried chicken, okay, with a name like CRISPR, come on now. You know, anytime my AP biologist teacher in high school was talking about Dr. Francis Crick, Crick, I'm thinking about a small stream to fish in a giant ranch. I mean, come on now, what are you expecting? I mean, as a comedian and a musician, I only have a cursory understanding of the biomological field these days, but biologists, I think, understand a couple things about musicians, particularly the idea of productivity. You know, in music, you got pre-production, post-production, and everybody's favorite, reproduction. Um, I, got a, I got a question for the audience tonight. Uh, who here is a fan of Star Wars? Nobody? Okay. Um, you may remember early in the story where Chancellor Palpatine t tells a young Anakin Skywalker, the dark side of the Force is a pathway to, some, to many abilities that some consider to be unnatural. What Chancellor Palpatine was actually talking about is public policy here in the United States. <laughs> because apparently, bison are con not considered wildlife in Gallatin County. I got another question for the audience. What's the difference between a herd of bison and a gang of frat boys here in Gallatin County? <laughs> Only one of those groups can cross the road without 17 of them dying. <laughs> I mean, I, I know they taste good. They can kind of be ranched. Um, but something s smells like a dead skunk on the middle of the road here because, I mean... <laughs> Both bison and frat boys seem like definitive examples of wildlife here in this region. I just, it doesn't make any sense to me. I mean, bison alone, let's just think about that. I mean, they're as wild as it gets. I mean, there's, they've been here forever. There's Buffalo Jump State Park down the street where <clears throat> sovereign nations hunted for thousands of years before any colonizers ever showed up with the idea of Earth Day. <laughs> let's recognize we're on stolen land. I mean, bison, did you guys not see the viral video of the bison taking out that Karen in Yellowstone last year? Holy cow, what a metric to see how uh, our society interacts with nature these days. It was, it was nonsense. Uh, she looked like she was trying to give the darn thing a Google review and she saw a lot more than five stars, hallelujah. I mean, just their heads alone, the bison, grow to be as big as a Toyota Prius. I mean, ain't nobody ever had a bison as a darn house pet, except maybe Ted Turner. Um, <laughs> enough about all that junk, though. I mean, like, what we're, what's special about today and why we're all here in this community experience so beautiful, we're not here just celebrating the earth. Every day is Earth Day. We all know that. We're here in Bozeman. But we're here to protect, honor, and advocate, activate celebrate the way of life that these natural resources bestow us. I'm talking about the shaded trails, the colorful wildflowers, the tasty fruit, you know, foraging mushrooms, the drum of a healthy river, the deliciousness of steak. I mean, come on now. It's something that we hold so central to our identity as Southwestern Montanans, and we get to, are so privileged to indulge in. It's also something that powder magazine in that darn TV show have turned into a second gold rush. So, you know, anyways, I, you know, no matter what your perspective is or your paradigm, financial incentives, there's two things that everybody can agree on in this valley. Number one, nobody wants to hit a vehicle while they're enjoying a podcast in a drive through Gallatin Canyon on the way back from Big Sky. And that Bozeman desperately needs a second Walmart. <laughs> no, no one. All right. <laughs> uh, maybe I'm alone there. But it's, you know, uh, the famous music producer Rick Rubin recently wrote, it's, uh, there's a time for every idea to be expressed through us. And the time, the idea for this time is these animal road crossings. They save lives. They save animals' lives. Let's give wildlife the infrastructure to traverse the human domain, much like how we give ourselves the tools to traverse the wild domain. You know, it just it doesn't make that sense. I'll leave uh, by saying, praise God. And I say God because my God is a woman and her name is Mother Nature. Hallelujah. <laughs> yes. Let's make the roads safer for us, for animals, let's let them live their lives like we live ours, and let's have less dead animals on the side of the road and more on our plate. Hallelujah. Thank y'all.
I don't see a bison on this PowerPoint. <laughs> you know, earlier Noah was saying that wildlife biologists take something for about animals and take it to them. Well, bison have very big beards, but I don't see anything on me that has anything to do with that. So don't know what he's talking about. While that loads. <laughs> so what does a person call a bison that goes to the gym? Exactly, yep, a buffalo. It's a terrible joke. I'm not even going to tell the college one because I'm sure you all have heard that a million times. I know I have way too many times. When you work with an animal that has a very few puns, it's unfortunate that very many times you hear the same joke Every single time you tell someone, hey, I'm a wildlife biologist that works at bison. And then you hear, hey, what did the bison say to his son when he went to college? And I just, I walk away at that point. I just don't even engage it. I don't bother. There's no point. Exactly. See, didn't even need to say it. Didn't even need to do it. No point to it. <laughs> Let me see if I can think of something better. Actually, someone give me a common animal. Oh, there it is. Okay, never mind. No bad jokes. Hello, everybody. My name is Jackson Doyle. If you haven't gotten the hint already, I'm a wildlife biologist with the Buffalo Field Campaign. It is a nonprofit that works in Yellowstone ecosystem to advocate and protect wild animals. And this is a presentation about what we do to protect animals, specifically bison on the roadways. Every year... The bison migrate out of Gardner, Montana and West Yellowstone. And once they come out of West Yellowstone following the Madison River, avoiding the town because no one wants to be in the town, as they keep going, they cross a busy highway 191. And that's where we come in. Every year, herds of hundreds of these animals, these 2,000 pound animals, migrate across this busy road. So we put up active signs. It's very easy to get accustomed to a sign that is there 24 seven. But when we put these signs up, you'll know, okay, bison are on the road as we speak. And unfortunately, as much as we try, we can't get them all, especially this year. This is one of the worst conditions I've ever seen, the worst collisions I've ever seen, where 13 buffalo were taken out in one collision. This little yearling here was the only known survivor, and his current whereabouts are unknown. Like many animals in this ecosystem, without a parent, it's very hard to survive. But we want to take that tragedy, and we wanted to turn that into hope. So we have a little tiny video showing exactly what we did this season to help protect that. There it is. Let's see if this works. I think I'll need you to play that video. Boom. Each spring, the Yellowstone bison must cross Highway 191 to access a safe place for their calves' first steps. Introduction of life to these young buffalo is blaring car horns and speeding semi-trucks. Despite BFC's efforts, 21 have already been hit this year. Twenty twenty three's intense winter has created thick snow berms, some as high as 5 feet, a barrier for the bison families migrating outside of the park. This drove BFC to action. Working with the Montana Department of Transportation, we have constructed several corridors for these wild migratory animals. As winter thaws, however, the need and urgency for BFC volunteers increases. We need you to help us get the baby bison across this busy highway to safety. So if you notice that one buffalo standing in that snow corridor, that is one of the corridors that we dug this year. 
We've had a lot of success with this program. We have done this in the past, but never have we had a winner this severe. In the last 13 years, it has not been this intense. We had berms over six feet, we found out, even higher than that. And even still, Horse Butte is covered with snow. If you build it, though, they will come. We gave them a simple little tiny corridor, and in three weeks, we have eight individuals captured on trail cams using just one of them. And currently, to date, it is over 20 to 30 animals, and we haven't even had a full migration yet. So when those bison were hit, it was right in an area, kind of like shown on that map before. They come out of the park, and they branch off following this river, right here, the Madison Arm Corridor. Looking at our field notes from last uh, 20-ish years, from 2007 to 2023, we can see where the bison migrate out of the park every year. These dark centers here are common areas where the bison roam. We can see two clear locations where the very dark centers are most present, Madison Corridor and the Duck Creek Corridor. So I simplified that map because it looks like a mess. To make this little pathway right here, showing the overall area for the Madison Arm Corridor and Duck Creek. These two main roads are the ones that they use, and this common location is where we believe a wildlife bridge should exist. If they have proper passageway and you give them easier access, bison are likely to use it. Bison establish herd knowledge, they establish migratory routes that pass down thousands of generations. So we believe if you give them a bridge, if you give them a structure that avoids a dangerous road so their calves don't have to access it, they will use it. Wildlife bridge detection systems can reduce collisions up to 87%. Wildlife bridges being the most effective, some up to 100% reduction in highway mortality. This is a little hypothetical doodle we had created to show our idea for this bridge. Basically, this continues onward. The road would go underground, past the tunnel, and then cross to the bridge as normal, giving the bison this migratory corridor that they use every year. Grizzly bears use this corridor as well, and just this year, a moose got hit. Grizzly bear came out to eat that carcass, and he was also hit. Grizzly bears are endangered animals in the ecosystem, and in Banff National Park, we have proof that grizzly bear genetics improved with a wildlife bridge, even with the fencing. Bison, animals, all wildlife have easier access to other animals of their own kind to increase genetic diversity in their populations by crossing these kinds of structures. So we ask you to support a wildlife bridge. This little QR code goes to a change.org link that we have that goes to support this bridge um, to kind of prompt the federal and state agencies to do better for our ecosystem, do better for the bison, do better for the grizzlies. Banff National Park, the first national park of Canada, has over 40 wildlife corridor crossings. How many crossings do you think Yellowstone National Park has? I want someone to throw out a number. Exactly. Nothing. That is inexcusable. The first national park in Yellowstone, and we have nothing. The only road in the United States where wild bison migrate, and we have nothing. That is unexcusable. That is a shame. It's shameful for our park system. So we say we need to build a bridge, and with the new grants coming in, the new law that offers $350 million to build bridges, we think National Mammal for Yellowstone National Park and the United States deserves that bridge. So I thank you for your time. All right, we have another little original for you here. It's called Stink Stank Funk. Wait, hold on. Oh, I feel high when you hit that beat. And with Thomas on the bass, can't stop my feet. I wanna get low with you next to me. So groove your ass on over, go groove your ass on over. Groove your ass on over. Well, I'm cool and I'm bad. But if you met me, boy, I bet you never ask. And I groove nice and slow. And if you saw me on the dance floor, boy, you know. Whoa. 
Yeah, stink, stink, funk don't make no sense now Get your high, feeling alive and not so tense Don't make no sense Stink, stink, funk don't make no sense now Get your high, feeling alive and not so tense Don't make no sense dance moves <laughs> am I working this time you guys hear me you got the laugh track loaded up you ready to go please all right thank you thank you I'm really love to see MSU grads making good right that's our state tax dollars going to work for you right there totally love it uh, we're at the point in the show where we're going to do a game show where all you guys get to pull out your far voices and be involved, which is gonna be amazing. So first off, I'm gonna, we're gonna set this up. We have just a couple of questions and you guys are going to answer those questions through some complicated QR code or something, right? And, uh, and then uh, we're gonna see if you got your answers right or not. That's what we're gonna do. But we're, and we're gonna use these specialists here to help us answer those questions. So let's start by, you just gave a talk. You introduced yourself, but why don't you introduce <laughs> yourself again and then pass the mic down there and we'll, we'll get going on this deal. Hello, my name is... Hello? It's on. It is? That's what they told me in the back. They said that this is... You wanna get up here and just like talk into this one? 
That sounds good. No. <laughs> Come on. So I'll just yell it. So my name is Wildlife Biologist. I'm a Jackson Doyle's Buffalo Fields campaign. This mic's not on. <laughs> what was it again? My name is Wildlife Biologist. I'm a Jackson Doyle. A Jackson Doyle, Wildlife Biologist. <laughs> just yell it out there. I, you know, pro project. I'm, I'm also with the Buffalo Field Campaign, and his job is to make me look good. <laughs> Liz Fairbank, rhodecologist with the Center for Large Landscape Conservation. <laughs> Rob Amitt, rhodecologist uh, at Western Transportation Institute, which is part of Montana State University. Awesome. All right, let's see if we can make this. Uh, good. Yeah, test. Let's see if we can make this thing work. Do we have a QR code that goes up there? We're going we're gonna to ask this first question. Then we're going to, uh, it was text to me. Is it working? It's working now. All right. All right. Okay. Done. So, uh, you guys ready? That's the QR code, except there's something in front of it. But that's the QR code. The first question we're going to ask you is, you ready? How many vehicles per hour create a complete barrier to grizzly bears? That means how many are, are there that stop them from crossing the road? Which is, I mean... How many, like, we, here, you're going you're gonna to talk right here. This whole thing, technology. All right, we're going to do it this way. So, did you guys get the question? Want me to repeat it? Thank you. Thank you, one person in the back. I was wondering if anyone was in this audience. All right, how many vehicles per hour create a complete barrier to grizzly bears so they can't, so they just basically just stop crossing the road? That's the question. Use that QR code up there. There's going to be a multiple guess thing. You guys fill out the multiple guess thing, and then we're going to see if you got it right or not. But first off, we're going to ask the question to some of our esteemed professionals here. It's like getting this whole thing happening with my goat at the same time, which is super exciting. Um, so um, that happens. Like here, hang on to this. That happens like roads, they just stop being used by animals. That's right. When traffic gets so high, animals quit trying to cross the road. And it's not well studied, but there was a very nice study here in Montana on grizzly bears on Highway 2, just south of Glacier National Park. And they put those little air tubes across the highway and counted vehicles. And then they had collared grizzly bears uh, that were using the landscape. And so they actually could calculate or estimate at what point how many vehicle vehicles Wait, travel away the answer. per hour. What? There's a guess. We have guesses up there already. Um, somebody handed me a piece of paper. So we have, hold on. This is our answers. This is our group answer. Is that a, is that, what is that? How many do we have up there? <laughs> I don't know how to read the answers here. The first one's, thank you. <laughs> this is working out awesome. So, <laughs> I never use these things in my classes. Because <laughs> Let's hear some numbers. Someone said 30? 10? 1,000. 1,000? She says five. Let's go with this kid. 1,100. What's your name? Is Lila correct? Is it 1,100? Drum roll, please. And the answer is 100. 100 per hour. <laughs> which is, <laughs> you got part of that right, 1,000 and 100. So 100, 100 per hour, that's a lot, right? What's our, that's not a lot? So, for example, interstate... 90 out here, we might see, what, about 20,000 vehicles per day. Divide that by 12, over 1,000 an hour. Wow. So 100 on little two-lane highway. It was amazing how significant those cars are for grizzly bear movement. You can imagine if the, 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 they, the good news about the, uh, the research was in the evenings and late at night, the numbers drop below 100 and that's when they would cross. So that's how they were able to come up with that 100 vehicles per hour. During the day when there was more traffic, the bears weren't crossing. So 
they're very worried that if more and more traffic increases, then all day long it'll become a total barrier. And that's when you have to do some things that fix that. And I don't know if we, we call them wildlife crossings. And it so, was mentioned earlier. So, so uh, I have no idea if this mic is working or not. So I'm just going to talk loud. Okay? Thank you, Brandon. That'll solve that problem. And I'm super good at talking loud. Uh, so, who's heard of the Elwha Dam? All right, so some of you haven't, but the Elwha Dam was this big dam in the Olympic mountain range that all the, behind the dam is filled up with sediment. And it was no longer useful as a whatever it was built. So, but at the same time, that dam had cut off all of the upper water, most of the Olympic mountain. That's about where the dam was. That dam moved so much. So, are these roads like dams? Is what you're saying when they reach about a hundred? At least for that particular yeah. species, and we haven't studied enough other species to know what their sensitivity is. Some so their range gets shrunk down more and more. They get compre they get compressed within their range, yeah. and they start fighting each other and right. other problems. Yeah, we like, can't we... enough niche diversity. Can't word. Uh, let's move to the next. Should we move to the next question? Yeah. Good, yeah, Mike, it's oh. going to you. No, it's going to you. Okay, we got. Oh, it's going to be great. Yeah. So. Uh, <laughs> Up there. What's the average cost of a collision with a deer? Actually, let's hand this one. We're gonna you're gonna answer that question? Do you know the answer? I hope. Let's so let's but let's let's talk about what is the you guys the QRR situation, you know how it works. But let's talk about other costs. I, I assume cost has options of dollars, right? But there are other costs. <laughs> All right. How many of you guys in this room are hunters? Oh, so hunter. Some of you are a hunter. Some of you have actually probably killed an animal, right? So some of you are not hunters, and I'll tell you something about hunting. If you go to the store, if you go to the store and you Not just the life of the deer, but it's hard in your heart, right? It's, it's traumatizing. Suck <laughs> out. <laughs> so, you have more to say? I mean, you told me up in the green room that he's in. Would you call yourself? An eco psychologist, eco psychologist, climate psychologist, All right. pan psychologist. Running over deer just depends. Sure, deer. Um, a pan psychologist is a psychologist of everything, so that includes deer. And okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's gonna be amazing. We're gonna dig deep into that. We're gonna ask how you feel about it. We're gonna. Have some time. Um, but let's get to the answer. Liz knows the answer. So what did you guys say? So everybody says what? Everybody says what? Everybody says. $10,000. Okay, what did we get? What do you know? So the actual number is just below $20,000. Um, so whoever, if anyone guessed that, good job. Um, and this is new numbers that just came out this year. And it takes into account both direct and indirect costs. So things, things like hunting, lost hunting revenue, uh, property damage, vehicle repairs, um, and then also passive use, like wildlife viewing and, and tourism and all of those other things factored in. It's just under 20000 Holy cow! Because that's the thing. You have to think about the extra cost, not just dented, dented or broken window. All that extra cost, right? You're not going to hunt with it. You have to deal with the... Bad feelings, like I'm not going to drive maybe for a while. There's also that. Very hideous. Let me ask you a question. Who in this room has hit an animal with their vehicle? 
Right, so we got about half of the people in the room, right? How many, how many of you know somebody that's hit a car with their vehicle? Hit an animal with their vehicle? Most of the people, right? These, these people are all dealing with PTS deer. Well, we have tons of animal collisions. Any animal that lives in the Yellowstone ecosystem and a lot of ecosystems where roads cut through their native corridors, their habitat, that will always lead to some kind of collision highway mortality. So moose, deer, grizzly bears, black bears, bison. It's happened to basically almost all animals in the Yellowstone ecosystem at some point in time. Elk too. Lizards, yeah. <laughs> one more, got another one? <laughs> Oh, he was giving me some advice. I'm just asking if he had any more. Okay. All right. Well, that's, that's Ready to go with the answer? All right. Let's see the answer up here. Then who's going to answer that answer? You know the answer? I believe I do. Do you? He, he knows it for sure. All right. Hold on. So the answer, what do we got? $4 billion dollars is the is the is the guest. Uh, uh, what is the, what's 500? Who got that's ranked? So 500 million is the lowest, I guess, down there at the bottom. <clears throat> what's the answer? Well, it was a national study conducted by Western Transportation Institute, right. my colleagues, and it was uh, uh, over six billion, uh, and that was many years ago. So, uh, it's a, and as you saw, the costs of collisions with deer have gone up. So those numbers. If we put them in 2020 dollars, would be much greater. So it's a it's an expensive proposition to do nothing. Is that per year? Per year. Who knows how much money we make in Montana agriculture per year? Per year. Wildlife crossing overpass. Yeah. yeah. Uh, they are two to four million, uh, um, and they come with accoutrements like fencing to guide the animals to them. So about two to four million. So cost savings in the long run. Yes. Yeah. They they do two things. They reduce the collisions with the big animals uh, by eighty to ninety five percent, and they also reconnect the landscape. So not only the big animals that we're talking about here, deer, elk, and moose, but the little critters also get across. So they have a lot of conservation value as well. And so it's kind of like removing the Elwha Dam, potentially. Yeah. I could you open up the habitat. Pretty awesome. Pretty awesome. That's awesome. Um, you guys have 
guys have any other closing comments on our little game show situation? No? No, you got something you want to say? Nope. Of course you do. <laughs> it's yours, man. Mike's yours. Um, let's see. If we restored all of the grassland habitats up and down the east range of the Rockies, we would take out um, twice the amount of carbon from the environment every year that we currently emit with our vehicles and so forth. So in order to, for that to happen, of course, we need to be able to create um, migratory corridors for, for bison. And so this is just, you know, the perspective of um, humans and wanting to avoid collisions, but in the bigger picture, basically what we're trying to do is restore uh, the natural ecosystem, and, and this is just a small part of it. Love it. Let's move on to some more music, some more stories, then we're going to have some interviews with these guys, get a little more depth about it, right? So why don't we do that? Let's move up. Hit it, you guys. <laughs>
paradise Put up a parking lot Hippie paradise Put up a parking lot <laughs> I guess so. I'm not announcing the life on the Oh, it's that time. It's, oh, wait, what time is it? It's, oh, yeah. it's a lifetime achievement award. Oh, wait. Deb in the house? Deb. Deb's in the house. Deb's in the house. Deb's in the house. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know why they want the in the alder. Alder's an awesome plant. It, you know, it, it uh, fixes nitrogen. But, but uh, these guys, I had these guys as students. I'm just so proud of them. It's the only ones that have done anything worth. It's just so, yeah. Uh, any rate, now I get to do the interview part. And let me tell you a little secret about how this whole thing is organized. The entire show. There isn't any, Okay. They're like, okay, this time you just walk out there and there's gonna be a couch, right? It's all gonna, you'll figure it out. That's pretty much what's going on. But we're gonna interview those guys that came out here that with, have with, the great insight. We're gonna start out right now with Tom and Jackson. You've met them several times already tonight. But I wanna dig in a little deeper about who these people are. Uh, so take the couch. You guys are ready? Take the couch. No, yeah, you gotta sit on the couch. Oh, oh, there you go. No, so have a seat. Here, everything's working out. So we, we heard from you guys earlier, but I kind of want to dig in a little deeper, right? You guys work together. You work together. We live together. You live together. You work together. You do pretty much everything together. Right. But you're an eco-psychologist, and he's a bison conservationist. Right, so he needs a lot of help. <laughs> Apparently. First off, these guys can't hear you. So you got to use the mic, and you got to tell them about what it is. So that's so, right. He needs a lot of help because he's, he's working with bison, so I have to counsel him. Let me, let me ask you a question. I started, I came out here tonight, and the first thing I did was I told some stories about how the, eco, the earth operates as this big ecosystem. It's all connected every, to everything. There's some bummer parts about, about things getting run over by cars. But I'm mostly stuck with this idea of the ecosystems operating at great big scale, right? Because the earth, even though there are road crossing problems, right? But there is an, there's amazing things on this planet and they're just being discovered. It's absolutely fantastic and wonderful, but also animals get killed by trucks. That's a bummer. So how do you, how, how do we help these guys? They're gonna leave tonight and be like, either they're gonna say, I gotta go get some Dixie cups and some string see you. Or they're going to be like, man, I'm selling my car. How, how do they deal with the, the, the psychological, you know, doldrums that we're forcing them into? By focusing on what we're actually doing. Um, so like the major discovery in my lifetime is along the lines of what you're saying, Bill, the earth is alive, right? The earth is a living, breathing organism. Yep. And we are all cells in that organism. Things have gotten really out of balance. And I would bet that everybody in this audience is a cell in Gaia's autoimmune defense system. And many of us have been activated. And so there's a, the way to think of it is that there's a larger intelligence that's actually calling us to her defense. And... One, there are many ways that we are coming to her defense, and this is one of them. We, my lifetime, and I'm about to turn 66, in my lifetime, um, we've eliminated 80% of wildlife in the world. That's out of balance. So now we're being called by Gaia to bring things back into balance. And so it's not coincidence that we're like, 
let's spend $350 million on wildlife passage. You know, and so what we're doing is coming back into proper relationship with wildlife. And we're coming back into proper relationship with the first peoples who have had who have symbiotically evolved with that wildlife. And we're coming back into proper relationship with Gaia, with the land, with the ecosystems. And we're becoming part of the ecologies. Let me, let me ask you yeah. a question. Man, that, those guys over in that room, they really got it together. So we live in a, um, we talk about ecosystems, right? But honestly, we live in a social ecological system because humans are just part of it. We're in the Anthropocene now, it's pretty awesome. Um, and, uh, but the ecosystem is still, we're still here. In fact, I just saw a video today of a macro, a macro video of a snail eating a strawberry. That was amazing. That was amazing. I live on the, we live on the same planet as that thing happening right now. What well, happens to every one of my strawberries? That's for sure. But the social ecological system we live in, right? You live in West Yellowstone, right? There's, there's some Thai food there and there's a great taco truck, right? Oh yeah. You like the place. Yeah. You drive a car. Yep. Right? So you're part of this system. Yep. Right? So how do you wrap in the social of part of the social ecological system, right? How does that work for you? So how do I like wrap my, like my Not just your society? own personal thing, but what's Yellowstone or how do we do it in general? So basically it's just, I would say being aware of the animals themselves, being aware of the place that you live in. We have the very lucky, fortunate place to live in a place that is so wild, that is so much like the Pleistocene that once existed. The only thing missing are the mammoths. So it's just to be consciously aware of what we have and to be grateful for the diversity and the life that we have. But Noah ecosystem. was out here just earlier saying, yeah, but I'm just listening to my podcast. Just driving <laughs> <on my own."> <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Man, I want my own laugh track that just follows me around. <laughs> so Noah was, I mean, you can't be aware of the animals all the time. You're listening to, you know, you're listening to your favorite podcast as you're driving from West Yellowstone to to uh, Bozeman. So how do you, but you still have to, so essentially we still do business of humans, right? But the ecosystem has to do the business of ecosystems. So how do we, without asking everyone to be super hyper aware, how do we blend those two things? Knowing that we're, we don't have our own failable, we have our own, we, we fail. We fail as humans all the time. So how do we set that up so we can not have that happen to us or the animals? So basically, just like how we make structures to help us, we make systems that help us, roads exist to benefit mankind, to benefit our ability to live in the world. Just like how bison in the past and still do create dirt roads that Native Americans would follow in years past. So really, just like how we construct things for ourselves, we have the foresight to know how to make things better for other animals. So it is to build things that allow us to connect with the ecosystem rather than keep us separate from it. So rather than just having a road that cuts through an ecosystem, we allow the bridges to be made that allows that ecosystem to function as we function. If we blend things together, it is possible to coexist with wildlife and humans. It is not something that has to be so separate behind a fence in a zoo. When things are wild, you have to make the structures around it relatable to that. Love it. There we go. Yeah, that's a good answer. And also, also we can all enjoy the game of Yellowstone Bingo. You know, you get the winner, like the, the, you fill in the center part if someone gets flipped in the air when they're trying to pet a bison, right? <laughs> Where's, what happened to the laugh track, man? Dude, that's your job back there. That was a funny thing I just said. Okay, love it, great answer, great answers. That's what I like to hear. Let's move into the next guys. So these guys are supposed to be five minutes with you guys. What, you got a what? Let's hear it. Drive more slowly. There we go. Thank you. I'm putting those guys on the couch. 
Yeah, exactly. All right, let's bring out uh, Liz and Rob. Yeah, there you go. Liz and Rob, everybody. Liz and Rob, everybody. Liz and Rob, everybody. Liz, Liz and Rob. That's you guys. There we are. Yeah, you can. There, you, there we go. Now we got you. That's a cue call. You know, it's tough doing theater. It really is. Okay, the, uh, let's start with Liz, because I want to follow up on that last question, right? We were talking up, we were talking before, right? Let's go back pre-Lewis and Clark, okay? Let's go back 200 years. Okay. And these animals are moving around the landscape, and they have really big home ranges, and they've got pathways. How... How, how much do those pathways move around? Like we have herds of elk moving across the landscape in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. Do they always sort of walk the same general area or what do they do? Yeah, so it, it depends on the species. Um, in some places like the first federally designated wildlife corridor in the US, the Path of the Pronghorn, we have archeological evidence that goes back uh, thousands of years to show that pronghorn have been moving along the same pathway. So unless, you know, human development roads, all these different things get in the way, um, animals will try and steep, keep moving along the same pathways and different species respond differently. Um, so like elk and mule deer have really high sight fidelity. They want to go in the same places all the time. Animals like pronghorn have more plasticity in their movements. They're, um, they don't necessarily always follow the same path, but they might follow the same like broad you, corridor. You, you get to use those words like fidelity and plasticity, you know. which I love words like that. Mm -hmm. I have no idea what those words mean. <laughs> Jesus Christmas, I really want my own laugh track. Oh my God, what is sight fidelity? Sight fidelity <laughs> is basically um, animals moving back and forth across the same area. So like they might stop at the same place to um, eat or bed down or uh, access water, different resources, things like that. So for th thousands of years, they're always going to the exact same place. Yep. Gotcha. And then uh, sci fidelity and plasticity. What's plasticity? Plasticity means that they um, are more flexible and they move around more. Like plastic. Like plastic. Yeah. It bends. Yeah, it bends. Yeah. So you can put an obstruction and they'll work their way around it. Mm -hmm. But other species, you put the obstruction and they're just like, what's happening? Right. Gotcha. Yeah. So if you put a road, so I guess if with that, if that's the logic, you could easily choose for some of those species that are, have fidelity. We're going to learn words tonight, aren't we? We have <laughs> fidelity and we have two Dixie cups and a string. That's all you need to do. So much. Um, so <laughs> if that fidelity, then you can put that bridge there and it's pretty much going to be successful, right? Yeah, unless, you know, unless land use changes, unless there's development or something else and it's no longer habitat, uh, if you place crossing structures in the right areas for wildlife and yeah. you protect the habitat on either side, then they're good to go. Let me ask, let me ask a question over here. How many bridges have been made where they just don't cross it. Wildlife crossing bridges. We're like, whoops, that was bad. Put it in the wrong spot. Um, there's just stories of them. There's been yeah. no like survey, but um, sometimes they have been uh, less than effective. And so <laughs> it's recommended. You gotta laugh, you gotta that, laugh on that one. Yeah. <laughs> Not <laughs> yet, please don't laugh at that. <laughs> we make mistakes. Uh, of course we do. Uh, but um, it's recommended that you always have some kind of fence attached to the crossing structure. Draws them in. To guide the animals to it. And so you, you've heard of beaver analogs. It, they use beaver mimicry structures. They're like, beavers are really good at doing restoration in rivers. So, so uh, stream restorationists are like, I'm just going to mimic beavers. And then hopefully the beavers will come in. So they build these sort of artificial beaver structures. Then the beavers show up and they're like, you guys are morons. No one would put a bridge there. Or a, I mean, a, a dam there, we'd put it over here. And then the restoration people are like, of course, that makes sense. Because the beavers are the pros. So that does happen occasionally, right? Yeah. They, yeah. Been but you're smarter than that. You're going to put it in the right spot. You've got lots yeah. of examples of where they work really well. Really well. So 
Uh, it's been uh, the first ones in North America were built in Canada in Banff National Park in the late 80s. So we have quite a bit of evidence and there have been many built since then here in Montana. US 93 in the Flathead Reservation has over 40 structures. So they're well tested and uh, they're 85 to 95% effective in reducing the collisions with the big animals. And again, as I mentioned- What was that number again? Sorry. Uh, 85 to 90, 99%. 85 to 90, yeah. just throws it off. 85 to 90% yeah. effective. <laughs> Right. I, don't think, I think there should be an ooh and ah button, isn't there? Um, but uh, that's amazing. Yeah. That's incredible. What's the worst road in, in Montana for, for uh, impacts? Um, I think it's not like the entire road. There's sections of... Because of the fidelity. Key highways yeah. where you have traffic and you have uh, rich wildlife populations and or migrations. So uh, they're, they're scattered about throughout, throughout the state. They're called hotspots. Because that's where the history of the crossings were. Let me ask you a question. How long have you been in this business? A little over a decade. A decade. And you've been, you said 30 years? So uh, just before uh, the old eco-psychologist, uh, I say old <laughs> He's only a few years older than me. But um, he said that in his lifetime, uh, the total density of, of animals has dropped severely. And that's been in the literature, right? Have you found that if you did a survey of how many animal impacts there have been over the last several decades, have you saw the numbers going down simply because the population is decreasing? Is that something that... Because essentially, cars are like survey units, and you... You smash into a deer, right? But when there's less and less deer, or more deer, I guess, in some places. Have you found that? Well, it, it, it's true. If, uh, if uh, population density decreases, usually wildlife vehicle collisions also decrease. Yeah. There have been some studies that, you know, tie that together, which makes sense. Uh, it's actually in suburbia, where a lot of deer crashes are, they actually try to reduce the populations yeah. Uh, in suburb, suburban America, and because of that, they get less wildlife vehicle collision. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I, okay, let me tell you something. When I, when I came out there and gave the whole talk about the salmon and the whatchamacallit, they said, be funny for five minutes. <laughs> I was like, That's a, I don't know how to be funny for five minutes or be clever, maybe, because the rest of the time, we're going to talk about killing animals with cars the whole time, apparently, is what was going to happen. So is there something like, if you want to leave these guys with a positive note, what would you say? I know what's in there. Positive, not necessarily my forte. Um, <laughs> but um, I guess the positive note is that most ecological issues are super challenging and they don't have a clear solution when it comes to wildlife vehicle collisions, when it comes to reconnecting habitats fragmented by roads. There are proven solutions, they work, and they even pay for themselves in the long run. It actually saves people money, it saves people's lives, it saves animals' lives. So it's, it's one of the few things that actually has a clear solution. Well, there you go. That's the answer right there. That seems like it makes sense. Um, all right, well, let me, I, let me check my watch here. Apparently, it's time for the Lifetime Achievement Award. Hang out there for a second. Well, I don't know. Hang out. There's someone that's supposed to come down. Who is that person? Uh, you're going to come down, and we're going to do the Lifetime Achievement Award. Uh, and I'm excited about it because I don't have to, I don't have to talk about it. She's going to talk about it when she gets up here. It's going to be incredible. Look, you ready? All right. Mike, here comes the mic. Hi. That one's not working. Is this one working? Okay. So, hi. I'm Deb Davidson. Um, I'm the vice president at the Center for Large Landscape Conservation. I actually work with Liz and Rob. Um, and I have the honor this evening to award Rob Ament with the 2023 <laughs> Earth Day Lifetime Achievement Award for his conservation service. <laughs> Thank 
<laughs> so I've known Rob since 2000 when I started to work for him when he was the executive director of American Wildlands. And since that time, I've had the pleasure of working with him um, in a variety of places and watched him rise in notoriety as one of the global experts on ecological connectivity and addressing the impacts of roads, railways, and canals on wildlife populations and their ability to move across the landscape. I'm proud to call Rob my friend, my colleague, and my mentor. Very lucky to, to know him. When Rob and I started working on wildlife corridors in the late 90s, this concept was not widely understood as being a key need for wildlife populations and healthy overall landscapes. The conservation movement was focused on ensuring that there were protected areas like parks and national monuments, which were all very important, but less the, the, or, um, the conservation movement wasn't as focused on integrated connected habitats. Rob has one, been one of the pioneers who's been steadfastly focused on wildlife corridors and habitat connectivity. And because of his work and a lot of our colleagues, um, it's now a mainstream conservation goal here in the U.S. and globally. We're very lucky. We've come a long way. He's also been one of the early adopters and visionaries on the needs to make roads and rails more permeable, everything we've been talking about tonight, and in turn making them safer to, to humans, as well as the ability for animals to move. He's one of a handful of people around the globe that have brought wildlife crossings into reality, and he's had a steadfast focus on this for over 30 years, both with his work at the Center for Large Landscape Conservation, where he's our senior conservationist, and MSU, Western Transportation Institute, where he runs the road ecology program. His leadership is also demonstrated, has been also demonstrated as being a global leader. Um, he's our, he's our, one of our co-chairs for something we call, it's the IUCN Connectivity Conservation Specialist Group and the Transport Working Group. Um, he also runs two USAID projects on wildlife and roads and rail impacts in Asia, and also has dozens, if not even more than that, road ecology research projects here in the US, Latin America, and in Asia. He's also made, he's also led research on this topic for years and then taken into policy planning and implementation, including being one of the key authors of the recently passed Federal Wildlife Crossings Pilot Program that you guys have heard about tonight, that is providing, well, through a grant program with the Federal Highways Administration, it's funding um, up to $350 million worth of wildlife crossings and associated, associated work across the country. And this is something that Rob and many of our colleagues worked tires, tirelessly on for over a decade. When, yeah, exactly. It's a huge success, yeah. So I've had the pleasure of traveling with Rob. Um, and when you travel with Rob to conferences, trainings, or field tours, it's like being with a rock star. Everybody wants to talk to him and to spend time with him and share the challenges they are having in their countries and hope he can help them. He's constantly being asked to present at conferences. He's the author, co-author on over 60 published papers and reports on road ecology, wildlife connectivity, and ecological issues. Rob travels extensively for work. In fact, he just got back from India, and he's going to be heading back to India again very soon. Um, and his travels have taken him to South America, Mexico, Europe, East Africa, and trips to Mongolia and Southeastern Asia, which is where most of his focus is now. Um, He's been able to see most of the charismatic megafauna in the world. Um, but one of his personal passions is Asian elephants, and he's working hard to ensure their impact from roads and rails is reduced. In fact, he was one of the folks who um, ended up securing one of the largest overpasses in India for both tigers and Asian elephant movement, which is amazing. Um, I'm almost done here because I feel like I'm going on, but I have a couple more things. Rob is also incredibly generous and caring. He volunteered and uses vacation time with an organization based here in Bozeman called the UK, U Ukraine Relief Effort. And he brought 500 pounds of medical supplies into Ukraine through Poland. He's now working um, to raise additional funds for more work to be done there. Um, in 2019, he personally raised money from family, friends, and colleagues to support the construction of a solar-powered fence around a school in rural Assam, India, where Asian elephants were coming into the schoolyard. There had been over 20 incidents and um, charging by Asian elephants of kids. And of course, 
they were going to start culling the elephants. And so Rob and partners put up an electric, a solar powered electric fence so the elephants can stay there and the kids can be safe, um, which is a cool story. Yeah. In the office, so that I only get to see Rob about half time because he spends half time with us and then half time up at MSU. So in the office, Rob's enthusiasm is contagious and you always know when he's there. He brings exciting discussions to us and lots of energy. He keeps dog biscuits in his desk drawer for the office dogs. He drinks countless numbers of coffee and he manages to burn microwave popcorn almost every time, including once having thrown, we had to, he threw a burning bag of popcorn, of uh, microwave popcorn out of the window. So, he's an avid hiker, biker, and skier, and his trusty border collie, Nitro, was often by his side during many of the, the adventures in the past decade. Nitro's no longer here, but Rob has many dog friends. Um, in conclusion, Rob's a pretty incredible human, and we're really lucky to have him here in our community and around the globe. So, Rob. <laughs> Something you want to give him? Oh, yes, I do. Yeah. I actually don't, I don't know what this is, Rob, but it's, it's some lovely gift. I don't, it's from Michelle, I think. Mean. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. I feel a bit set up tonight. <laughs> you were set up. All right. We're gonna, we got one more song for you. Can you hear me fine? Sick. Um, we were asked to do a cover, thank you, um, of a song that felt appropriate for this occasion. So we chose to do What's Going On by Marvin Gaye. Um, it was written in a time of extreme turmoil and kind of speaks to the fact that in order for change to happen, awareness needs to be brought about. And I think that's really fitting for this event. Thank you to everyone for coming and expanding your knowledge on issues like these. And thank you for everyone who presented today, um, spreading your knowledge and putting your life's work into these issues. Here you go. Find a way to 
to bring some love in here today. Picking signs, picking lines. Don't you punish me? Brutality. Talk to me, and we can see. Thank you for coming. Love it. Everybody gets a laugh track. Everybody gets a Dixie cup and a string. All right. Thank you. Oh, things ain't what they do. 